Jason Schwetz of TripleNet realized early on that crowdfunding was going to transform the way that real estate is financed and set about building a model to capitalize on this paradigm. Welcome to the National Real Estate Forum podcast, episode 230. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Dr. Adam Gower, and this is the nationalrealestateforum.org, where I speak to leaders of the crowdfund real estate industry so you can learn how to raise capital, build wealth, and earn passive income from crowdfund real estate deals. Well, I'm happy to announce this week that my first book, Jacob Schiff and the Art of Risk, American Financing of Japan's War with Russia, 1904-1905, was published by the top five publisher Palgrave Macmillan this week. The Art of Risk is an extremely detailed historical analysis published by the top five publisher Palgrave Macmillan this week. The Art of Risk is an extremely detailed historical analysis of the way one of America's greatest financiers mitigated risk and how he assembled the largest syndicate of investors at the time. I wrote the book initially for an academic audience, but don't let that put you off. Look, it's not an overtly crowdfund related book, but it occurred to me that the story is one of capital formation during an era that was exclusively one of crowdfunding, i.e. it took place before the 1933 Securities Act started restricting how the general public could be solicited. Go to today's show notes page at the nationalrealestateforum.org website, nreforum.org forward slash Jason, for a link to more information including an intro video, a sample chapter, and of course, a buy now button. My guest today, Jason Schwetz, is also one who has sought a way to mitigate risk in investing in real estate and using his experiments while taking on no debt. He's created a novel way to participate in his deals, and you can find a link to his website at the show notes page for today's episode at nreforum.org forward slash Jason. Incidentally, I was introduced to Jason through one of my recent students at Cal Poly, a fellow called Austin, who took the initiative to make some calls while studying my course. I'm glad that he did. Jason is an inspirational real estate entrepreneur bridging the gap to tech in order to expand his business into crowdfunding. Hello, this is Jason. Jason, Adam Gower. Hey, Adam, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Oh, you know, hanging in there, fighting the battles of the world, trying to win one. <laughs> that sounds good. Hey, thanks so much for being so accommodating of, uh, of my students. My pleasure. Yeah, it was really nice of you uh, to do I that. I think it's exciting to see young people getting into the business and really... ...of uh, of my students. My pleasure. Yeah, it was really nice of you uh, to do I that. I think it's exciting to see young people getting into the business and really having a passion for it and understanding it. And uh, I remember, I remember my days when I was that young and doing the same thing. So hopefully it's... Uh, it's a little opportunity to to pay back. Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, I remember my uh, when I was that age as well. It was before the telephone when I was doing <laughs> it. The first, so we had to use pigeons and telegrams. It was, uh, and smoke sk- smoke signals. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Of course. Uh, but uh, all right. So why don't we start? Tell me a little about Jason. Tell me who you are and what's your background, and and then t- you know, kind of migrate into how. About you know triple net zero and the kind of the, this niche that you have, okay, in real estate. Originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia, went to college in the mountains of Virginia, graduated out of Los Angeles. Uh, literally started at the bottom collecting delinquent rents. Uh, that was that was interesting in and of itself. I moved from collecting delinquent rents to property management, uh, from property management on to leasing from leasing to financing, financing you know, shopping centers. From that, went to basically acquisition dispositions. I, I will say through the whole cycle, uh, what, I, what I enjoyed the most is working with companies and leasing space and understanding their businesses and how they're going to fit into the property, whether it's a shopping center or single tenant property, I, either way. So I've I've done anything and everything there is to do with a shopping center with the, the sole exception of I've never purchased dirt and built from the ground up. I have added on to shopping centers. I've torn down. I've renovated centers. I've torn down. I've renovated. 
anything and everything there is to do except ground up development. Then the internet came along. And over the years of being in the shopping center business, I, I noticed that there was, there was definitely the beginning of an impact on, you know, the, the bricks and mortar of, of shopping centers as a result of the internet. And I got increasingly more frustrated because my industry just wasn't addressing the issue. They, they almost had their head in the sand for years. Addressing what issue? Uh, the issue of the impact of, of the internet on shopping centers, on traditional shopping centers. Oh, I see. And, you know, for years and years and years, they, they, they just would not, you know, there was no conferences on it. There was, they just, they just ignored it. And as a shop, and as a shopping center owner, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of, you know, lots of shopping center owners across the country, there was no way not to feel the effect. I mean, I remember the days of, of leasing a space, you know, let's say it was 12, 1500 square feet and it, your space goes dark or your tenant moves out and your list of prospective tenants were, you know, 25 to, to 50 tenants, 50 tenants long. Today, that list is pretty much non-existent. I mean, it, it is a short, short list of what is available to move into shopping center space. Yes, there's the traditional food, you know, which I think will will be around for a while. Although I I have my concerns for for that as well. And and having seen that and seen all of the what I call unnecessary friction that went on in purchasing a commercial piece of property, going through the requirements of whether it was a governmental entity or the lenders that they put you through, combined with the challenge of shopping centers themselves, i.e., the, the effects of the shopping centers by the effect on the shopping centers from the internet. So that drove me to, okay, there's got to be a better way. You know, what is it? And I basically went back and revisited as many of my deals as I could, and I went through them and, and tried to pick out what wasn't necessary or what could I do instead to make the parts of the transaction unnecessary. And after a long time, and while at the same time trying to figure out a model where I could be, for lack of a better term, internet resistant. I don't, I don't know if there's anything out there that I would call internet proof, but I think it's safe to say there are tenants out there that are internet resistant. I don't, I don't know if there's anything out there that I would call internet proof, but I think it's safe to say there are tenants out there that are internet resistant, a term I've been using for, for many years. And interestingly enough, I'm starting to see that, that term being used out there, which I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So I, I, I came up with, you know, the model that I have now, which is basically in, in simple terms, buying single tenant, triple net properties across the country for all cash. That's the, that's the simple version of, of what I do. And what I've, what I've attempted to do and have successfully done so far is make the transaction as simple as possible, not only from my perspective, but from a potential investor's perspective. Be sure to check out the introductory video and free chapter of my new book, Jacob Schiff and the Art of Risk, on today's show notes page at the National Real Estate. I'm extremely interested in this model, but let me step back for a moment before we get to okay. it, because I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about your view and your understanding of shopping centers. Just tell me a little about where was the, you know, when you talk about shopping centers and the impact of the internet on shopping centers, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is food service and restaurants and, uh, yes. you know, the kinds of things that people go to for some kind of social experience as well as consumption you know in a location beyond their computer so uh, tell me just a bit more about shopping centers and the impact of the internet on shopping centers i noticed that you've been active member and uh, highly qualified at icsc as well so just give me just kind of paint a broader picture of what it is that you've seen over the last few years, in particular, let's say over the last 10 years or so, to Rome, uh, because the, and the reason that I ask is that the pivot to 
triple net lease properties is is a pivot away from shopping centers. So yes. it's that link that I'd like to understand a little better. Okay. Well, I, I, I wear a unique hat uh, when it comes to shopping centers in that although I have been a landlord uh, many, many, many times, uh, 39, 40 times as a landlord, I am also a tenant. I'm also, I also own and operate businesses in other people's shopping centers. Uh, and have done so. My, my longest business, which I still have, happens to be a restaurant, uh, which we just celebrated our 26th year anniversary. So when you when when I look at a shopping center, I, I look at it from two perspectives. One is as the tenant, and I can see the impact of what goes on around me, and I can also feel it as a landlord, uh, seeing what's happening. One is as the tenant, and I can see the impact of what goes on around me. And I can also feel it as a landlord, uh, seeing what's happening, what's happened to my rent rolls over the years and the types of tenants that I focus on to put back into vacated spaces, i.e. tenants that are, again, what I call internet resistant. So the, the impact has been, you know, there's not nearly as many trips to the shopping centers that there used to be prior to the internet. There just, there just isn't. The, the, the tenants that used to fill shopping centers just are not there the way they used to be. And I think one of the biggest impacts on shopping centers going down you know, the, the, the long road is, you know, Adam, when you and I were younger, our generation, when, when there was a, a kid in college or high school and that, that kid or that group of kids had that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, ever that had that dream of starting their own business, 99% of them needed real estate. They needed a space. A lot of that was a shopping center space. Some office, but a lot of it shopping centers. And when that dream came to life and they were able to put their business plan together and actually go out there and be that entrepreneur and start that business, it was in a retail space. That does not exist today. 99% of the kids today that are in college or high school that have that entrepreneurial spirit and they have that brainstorm of a new idea, none of it includes a retail space. Those girls and or guys are not interested in opening up a dress shop or a clothing store of 12, 1500 square feet in a shopping center. It's just not there. So what you're left with is, you know, trying to find tenants that are resistant to the internet. Um, that actually understand business and can run a business and start a business and pay the rent. And I think that's very challenging in today's shopping, center, shopping centers and in today's market. Very challenging. All right. So what's a triple net lease property and how is it different from a shopping center and how is it you migrated into that space? Okay. Um, well, a triple net lease is a, is, a, is a form of a lease. They exist both in a shopping center as well as in single tenant. I migrated away from multi-tenant shopping centers to single tenant uh, properties. What I liked about the shopping center you know, business is you, you were diversified across many different businesses. If you had a, a 10 or 15 tenant building shopping center, you know, you were each tenant only occupied a certain percentage of your rental income. When you switch over to no, when you switch over to single tenant properties, 100% of your rental income is dependent upon that one tenant. So you really need to be careful when you're out there looking in the single tenant triple net market. So you say to yourself, okay, what is single tenant triple net? The best example I can give you is, you know, let's say a McDonald's. A McDonald's is a freestanding building. It has one tenant in it, a credit tenant, and they occupy what we call in the industry a single tenant triple net property. Now, the, the, the technical definition of triple net is the tenant pays for all of the taxes, insurance, utilities, and maintenance. There is a term that is loosely used in the, in, in the industry known as absolute triple net. I will tell you this. Let me back up to the term triple net. I am very frustrated when I deal with commercial real estate people across the country, that real estate people across the country that misuse the term triple net. You, you cannot have 
a triple net lease with landlord responsibilities. You will see properties advertised all the time that use the phrase triple net lease, minimal landlord responsibilities. That is an oxymoron. It, you can't have the two. So, but it's used. So I, I caution people when they are out there and they're looking for, you know, single tenant, uh, triple net properties, you know, be careful of the way these leases are written and the way it's being presented to you. The, a triple net lease is a lease and a single tenant property where the tenant pays for absolutely everything. And I mean everything. What kinds of things, when, when you talk about minimal, what, what are the things that are left over? Um, minimal landlord responsibilities, roof and structure only. That's a classic. Okay. That's not a triple net lease. It's just not. That's a double net lease. And, and, and I would debate anybody on that. And it's misleading. And it's frustrating because as someone who buys triple net properties, I will see, you know, I'll get somebody will submit a property to me that claiming it's triple net. And I request a copy of the lease and I read the lease. And sure enough, there's a clause in there that says the landlord's responsible for, let's say, the roof as an example. Well, that's not a triple net lease then. It's just well, not. So abs- when you talk about absolute triple net, is that the, is that the definition that you're looking for? Is that the yes. definition you're making? Okay. Yes. So let me ask you a question. Abs- how is an absolute triple net lease different from a land lease? You mean from a ground lease? A ground lease, yeah. Okay. Okay. So... An absolute triple net lease different from a land lease. You mean from a ground lease? A ground lease, yeah. Okay, okay. So a a absolute triple net lease, if it was just worded that way, that basically means you are buying the building and the land. You you are purchasing the building and the land. Um, however, the tenant is responsible for absolutely everything. And I'll give you some you know real life some real life examples. Um, let's say, let's say, you know, and I've actually had this happen. I'll have a, a, one of my tenants and and I only deal with regional, national or international tenants. I don't, I don't have any, you know, individual or mom and pop operators in any of my single tenant properties. So let's say I get a phone call from, you know, management of one of these companies and they say, Hey, Jason, you know, somebody backed into the building and we're sending you a picture. And I respond back with the responsibility of the tenant. Everything. It doesn't matter if the roof leaks. When the real estate bill comes, it's their responsibility to pay the real estate bill, to pay the real estate tax bill, and then send me confirmation that it's been paid. When the insurance comes up, it's their responsibility to pay that insurance bill, send me confirmation that the insurance has been paid. They, they, an absolute triple net lease, literally, Adam, the the only thing that that I do on my end is make sure the rent has been deposited into the account. That's it. So it is similar from a landlord's perspective to a ground lease. Is now a ground a, lease, the, the difference. To, I, I, I I sorry I missed that. The, the the ground lease. The difference is when you're buying a ground lease, you're buying the dirt only. You are not buying the building. So what does that really mean? What it, well you're the, leasing you're leasing the ground. I mean, you're not the the relationship with the landlord. I mean, you're not the the relationship with the landlord. And I don't mean to split hairs, just that I'm working on a ground lease at the moment. Uh, A ground lease, you're, as the tenant, you're leasing the ground and then you're building the building. But you have 100% responsibility. You're basically just sending a check to the landlord for lease of the land. In this case, it's very similar, isn't it, with an absolute triple net? It's just... There's only one difference. Yeah. The, the 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 real difference that separates a absolute triple net lease and a I, I guess for a loose word an absolute uh, triple net ground lease is that if you are the lessor and you own the ground you cannot depreciate you have nothing to depreciate you can't depreciate land on your taxes so the only difference between the two is if you if you buy a property or if you buy a property that is has a building on the land, you can depreciate the building. You cannot depreciate the land. Building. You cannot depreciate the land. Not that there's anything wrong with a ground lease. Not at all. Um, in fact, I, 
I converted a, I have a shopping center here in Southern California and I had a pad building that actually had the building on it and we decided to convert the building from a regular triple net lease to a ground lease. So the tenant took over the full responsibility of the entire structure. We basically gave them the building. Mm-hmm. And knowing, you know, that we're not going to be able to depreciate that building, or I should say not be able to depreciate the land underneath it because you can't, but the building, we would lose that small depreciation on it. So it really comes down to a tax perspective. Interesting. Okay, so let's let's um, move on to Triple Net Zero, your your website and your business. And so now you've identified a different, slightly different asset class, the single tenant triple cover the opportunity to advertise that and to raise money online from investors, you know, from the crowd or using crowdfunding. Okay. Well, I've been following crowdfunding, and when crowdfunding made that jump from crowdfunding to real estate, that was very exciting. I, I see that as a, uh, obviously it's grown and grown and grown, and I think it's going to continue to grow. But that was an opportunity to be able to have an audience, a potential audience that is nationwide, as opposed to an audience that would be made up of uh, either your family and friends or an extension of your family and friends, i.e. their their referrals. So, you know, real estate crowdfunding kind of opened the doors to the, the rest of the country, so to speak, no matter where you're at. Did, when did you see that happen? That was back in probably 2013, when uh, shortly after the, the, the laws had been put in. Happen. That was back in probably 2013, when uh, shortly after the, the the laws had been put into place as a result of the Jobs Act, that you know, following that and and then watching what was going on in the market and people toying with the idea and actually implementing, you know, traditional or what we know now as commercial real estate crowdfunding. What were the first signals that you saw at that time? Do you remember? I think you know one of the, the the biggest players in the market today, and probably the first to have a footprint in commercial real estate in the crowdfunding space is was Mogul Realty. I think they were kind of the first ones to say, "Hey, you know, this is a this is a platform that can work." And following that, as well as you know others that followed after them, not only you know talking with them but reading their websites, it, it definitely caught traction I would rules and regulations that are out there because you two thousand fifteen when when the rules and regulations you know started kind of being solidified and and the the regulators kind of understanding them and and I'm in agreement with you know a lot of the rules and regulations that are out there because you don't want that inexperienced person investing in what could be a very complex investment that they're not going to understand. That's right. just a recipe for problems. So you saw a Realty Mogul and bridging the gap between business crowdfunding and real estate. What was the effect of that on your business model and how you viewed the world and the path to triple net zero and what you're doing today? Well, it, it, it really opened up the opportunity to to be able to source capital from across the country. And so then what I needed to figure out was, okay, you know, the, the shopping center model as it's been around for you know, for decades and maybe even a century, is just not a model that I think it was sustainable in it in its current state. I just think that you know, shopping center owners are really needing to rethink the whole shopping center concept, and I did not want to be in that space. You combine that with the level of difficulty of lenders, and when I say level of difficulty of lenders, just their inability to understand assets, shopping centers, complex shopping centers, and it, and obviously that led to you know a disaster in 2007 2008 and so on i tried to figure out a way how can i avoid all of these all of these issues and having gone through the you know my past deals and tried to pick out what you know what is not needed or what can i do to avoid those challenges or that friction as i call it i arrived at buying single tenant triple net properties for all cash the only way to do that, the only way for me to diversify my own capital across as many different buildings and as many different states as I could. In other words, uh, kind of being similar to owning 
uh, multi-tenant buildings, having the diversification of a multi-tenant building, but without the risk of a shopping center. So I started looking at, you know, absolute single-tenant, triple-net properties across the country. You know, I, I only have a limited amount of capital, so I don't, I don't want to own 100% of one property. I'd rather own 1% of 100 properties. That's just my personal investing philosophy. So the only way to accomplish that would be to, you know, bring in investors. So what's the what's the most efficient way to bring in investors? Uh, in my opinion, it's it's real estate crowdfunding. Yes, this, the traditional family and friends is still there. That's still alive and well. But bringing in, you know, investors through the crowd because you're, but bringing in, you know, investors through the crowd because your audience now is is nationwide makes it more efficient, and I think it will continue to become more efficient. So I understand how you got to the concept. How did you build the business, and what have been the biggest challenges? Right, Just tell me again. Right at the beginning, what were the what were the first things that you did to start the business? You've got a pool of your own money. You want to diversify. You've ident- identified some assets. Uh, presumably, you identified one asset that you wanted yes. to buy and yes. crowdfund. Tell me about that story. Tell me about the first the first deal you did and how you crowdfunded it. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to do so. It's actually a, a, a fun and, and interesting story. So I found a property in Ohio to start with, and it, it, it was after looking at probably hundreds and hundreds of properties and looking for one that I felt was together. We finally finalized the website. I put it up to, you know, I put the website up with the property on it and sent it out to, you know, the crowd, so to speak, along with people that I knew. The very first person that stepped up said, Jason, I want to do the whole deal. And I said, I'm sorry, you can't do the whole deal because I put my money into every property. So if you'd like, we can do the deal together. And that's what started it. Just that first property had two people in it, me and, and this, this investor. And was this investor somebody you knew previously or a, or somebody you didn't know previously? I, I vaguely knew them. It was as a result of a previous deal I had done many, many, many years ago. And they became aware of my crowdfunding and what I was doing. They saw the website. It excited them or got them interested, I should say. And we got together and talked many, many years ago, and they became aware of my crowdfunding and what I was doing. They saw the website. It excited them or got them interested, I should say. And we got together and talked about it and said, I want, I want to do the whole thing. And that's when I said, no, you can't do the whole thing. Okay. And, and interestingly enough, that investor, along with others, I'm I'm very pleased to say that I have a 98% reinvestment rate. So 98% of my investors have reinvested. Okay, so let me ask you one question and then let me ask you what your business strategy is. So that you mentioned okay. one thing, you said you went out to the crowd. You put a website up and you went out, you went to friends and family and you went out to a crowd, to the crowd. How did you go out to the crowd? What does that mean to you? <laughs> right? What exactly it, did you do? It, it's posting, you know, getting your website up and then focusing on uh, SEO, search engine optimization, which that is a whole nother subject, real estate crowdfunding. It would be once you are live on the internet, how do you get people to see it? And that comes down to SEO, which is extremely challenging. Extremely. Hmm. So that's probably the single most difficult thing that I guess you could say links the real estate to the technology that is most difficult is, is getting your name known or getting people to see you apart from the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crowdfunding sites that were out there, and they're still out there. So that that was the most challenging. So that's when when I say putting out there, your first step is getting your website live. But then you not only got to get your website live, but you got to get people to see it, and hopefully make the phone ring. And it just it starts slow and builds from there. Right, slow and builds from there. Right. So now tell me. So tell me about your strategy. Tell me okay. about that. Minimum let's, let's investments start. and etc. Let's start with the criteria because that's the, the the easiest one for me to go over. Yeah. I look for single tenant, 
triple net properties anywhere in the United States, $1 million or less. The only states I stay out of is I do not buy in California and I do not buy in Illinois. So other than other than those two states, I look anywhere in the country. I look for what? a single tenant. Why not so California? I, <laughs> Why not California? <laughs> Having done business in California for the last 32 years, both as a businessman as well as commercial real estate, in, in my opinion, the amount of regulations that this state has combined with the constant new regulations that come about almost every six bout, almost every six months. It's just, in my opinion, not worth it. Is it great to live here? Yeah, it's great to live here. It's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, the weather is awesome, but it, it is a very, very, very challenging place to run a business. And if you're a landlord of businesses and it's challenging to run a business, it's going to impact you, period. Let's continue the story of, of criteria. I'm fascinated okay. to hear. Okay. So out of um, California and Illinois, what are you looking for? Un- single net, triple net, sorry. Single, single tenant, single triple, tenant net. triple net, under a million dollars. Now, okay. I will say that, that there's a variance to almost all my criteria. Um, I have gone over a million dollars. The last, per- last property I purchased was a Hardee's. It was over a million, but it was because it was a fantastic purchase. It just, it just had all the right metrics that I look for and more. So it's like, okay, then some, you know, so I go over the, the, my, my hard and fast, so to speak, criteria. I, I look for known tenants. I, I, I'm, like, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't buy individual mom and pops or, or single tenant operators. I look for, uh, it could be local, regional, national, or international. Everything from, I have a, you know, one of my tenants is the second largest uh, Papa John's franchisee in the chain. They have a, a, just under 150 locations. That type of tenant, I love. That's a that's a great, you know, opportunity. And will they On guarantee that? Will they guarantee the lease at the parent level? In in some instances, I'll give you an example where um, I have a property in Tennessee that is occupied by the world's largest industrial and medical gas company. They they are a forty eight billion dollar company and their signature is on the lease. So that's a corporately guaranteed lease as me and their signature is on the lease. So that's a corporately guaranteed lease as opposed to what what's known as a, a franchisee guaranteed lease, which you know I have several of those as well. So it comes in different forms and, and each form comes with its own valuation. I have a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Regis. They're the world's largest hair care company. Uh, they're one of my tenants in one of my buildings, and they have over 10,000 locations publicly traded. Uh, that's a great tenant to have. You kind of know you're going to get your rent. So as a, as a criteria, I look for what I call known tenants. Strong franchisees are okay. Years remaining on the lease is flexible. You know, I, that's a, that is something I look at very closely. That combined with you know, what I view as the real estate itself. I have some very strong no's. I do not buy banks. I do not buy payday loans. I don't buy real estate where the leases have what's called a right of first refusal. And I don't buy leases that have what's called an early termination right. So those are my my no's. And those are frustrating because I can be looking at a property and it's great. Everything about it, I love and it has a right of first refusal in it, and I'm out. It knocks me out. And now, what kind of financial criteria, Jason? Of the tenant? Yeah, uh, of the of tenant. The okay, of the occupant. Yeah. I, I I focus very heavily on what's called the rent to sales ratio. It's especially true in businesses like, let's say, uh, food. Being a food operator myself, I I know where my rent needs to be in relation to my overall volume. So I, I understand the food guys intimately um, as where their rent needs to be when I know that they are they're very profitable. And the more, more likely they're going to be in that space for a very, very long time. So I do look at the rent to sales. I look at uh, car counts. In other words, if, if I'm looking to purchase or have already purchased, let's say, uh, an, an oil lube and change place, I have two Valvolines. I look at how many cars a day they're doing. I look at what's their average ticket price, 
And from those numbers, I can determine how profitable they are and, again, how likely they are to stay there for a very, very long time. So the, the, the sales volume of the individual location, that metric is very important. It's not the only one. When you look at, for example, my, my industrial and medical gas tenant, that was not only the, the corporate guarantee, but it really came down to being 750 feet from the on-ramp to four major freeways. Knowing that and knowing that being that close to the on-ramp to those freeways that was probably the convincing part for me on that deal. Now, what kind of returns are you looking for? All of our returns are anywhere from 6%, and all the all the distributions are paid monthly. So we do monthly distributions. The returns are anywhere from 6% on up to just under 9%. Uh, most of them grow annually, and when I quote my returns, I do it very differently than, than everybody else I've seen out there. I quote only the actual return that goes in your pocket each month. I don't do projections. I don't do anticipations. I don't do a term that they call projected ROIs. I don't do any of that. I do it the way that it was done 50 years ago where Sam and Bill and Sally threw their money into a hat. They bought a piece of property. When the rent came in, they divided it up, and they went on their way. piece of property, when the rent came in, they divided it up, and they went on their way. And now what about fees? Do you charge fees? There is. There's, there's obviously a cost of doing the deal, escrow fees, title fees, things like that. There is a cost of acquisition fee, which typically runs all of my fees all combined, including escrow, title, and everything, are usually under 3%. And the industry you know, calls it load factor or whatever. I haven't seen anybody out there yet that has been able to have, have fees less than mine. Okay. Uh, especially and be able to generate the returns that that I generate on all cash purchases. That's right. the difference. It's a yeah. I'm fascinated by it, uh, Jason. So so you have a uh, you, an acquisition fee that includes you know all the expenses, etc. What about ongoing management fee? There's no management fee. What there is is a a sponsor and investor split. So as the sponsor, it's fifteen percent, and the investors get eighty five percent. Uh, so that's kind of in, in that's, oh okay. So you promote them. Okay, that's interesting. And then you're the I'm also an investor. Right, you're co-invest. Okay, and typically, yeah. what percentage do you co-invest? Here, let me let me quote it to you this way because it, it, it's easier. Because that's a that's a very common question that I get asked. Okay. So inevitably, I'll put a piece of property in, in escrow, and you know I've got to raise X dollars, you know, a million dollars, let's say, mm-hmm. and I'll get commitments, you know, during the escrow period. Of, of enough money to, you know, close the deal. And inevitably, you know, in almost every deal, you get towards the end and somebody says, you know, Jason, I was going to put in 150, but, you know, I, I can only do 100 right now. Okay. So as we get closer, it it's me. I wind up putting up the difference. So my investment ranges anywhere from 10000 on up to 60000 in a given property. Up to 60000 in a given property. Okay. And I... Will you backfill if you put in more than you want to? Will you fill it up after you close? Um, I have done that. I've actually I did that on this most recent deal. I, I I filled it myself, and then I am making that available to investors, you know, right now because it's it's a large amount. But I wanted the okay. property because it's a great property. All right. So you are talking. I mean, you were quite literal about one percent. Then if it's ten thousand on a ten million dollar deal, and then what on a one million dollar deal, and what is the minimum investment that you look for? Ideally, I like to stay above seventy-five thousand dollars. If it's if it's an existing investor, which I have a lot of them, and they come to me and they say, "Hey, you know, I'd like to do fifty in this deal," as long as I know them and I know their financial background, uh, I'm okay with that. I don't want, you know, I don't want investors that that are not sophisticated. The more sophisticated the investor, the more they understand, the better off they are. The investor, the more they understand, the better off they are, the better off I am. Okay, so how do you establish that? I mean, you're out there in the crowd, right? Somebody logs on, they register like I did this morning, and uh, they see a deal and they say, I'm in for, you know, 100 grand. How, so what's your pro? First, actually, I, let me back up on that question. Okay. Are you using 506B or 506C? 
which speaks okay. to how you how you verifying accreditation. Okay. I yes, I look for accredited investors. However, I don't have to. The reason why I don't have to, even though I do, is because I'm investing my own money in every deal and I'm only doing my deals. In other words, if you know, if if somebody called me up and said, which has happened, hey Jason, I got this deal, I want to raise money for it, can I put it on your platform? No. No, the answer is no. I don't do anybody else's deal on my the only deals I will do. Why does that? Uh, well, it just explain to me how that eliminates the need for you to have to, to solicit co-investors who are accredited. How does that work exactly? Because we, we're partners. I'm not acting as a. Uh, it, it, again, it's no different than if you and I put our money in a hat and buy, bought the piece of property together. You, you don't fall under. We don't fall under the requirement of an accredited investor. However, I will tell you. All of my investors are accredited investors. And do you verify Even, that, or you don't? Is that just you well? Know? They, they they send me. I, I make them give me their financial statements. I okay. have extensive phone conversations with them. I'm I'm looking for two things. I'm, I'm looking for a sophisticated investor who has the financial capacity that is not going to call me up one day and say, "Hey, Jason, I need my twenty five thousand back." Looking for a sophisticated investor who has the financial capacity that is not going to call me up one day and say, "Hey, Jason, I need my twenty-five thousand back," okay. because I'm not <clears throat> these properties that I purchase. I, I tell these people up front. In fact, when I run my numbers, I, I do something that nobody does, and that is, or I should say, I don't do something that everybody does. I do not project a sale price. It, this is, these are cash flow per purchases only. They are not purchased with the intent to sell in three or five years. So that what is being, the intent? What is the, yeah, what is the strategy then? Well, that, that being said, I will tell you. I have two criteria to sell. Number one, I have to be offered an absolutely ridiculous amount of money where I would be negligent not to sell. That's number one. Okay. Number two, I have to have the opportunity, not necessarily do it, but I have to have the opportunity a lot of property owners out there that get convinced by the brokerage community to sell an A property. So they get all excited because the broker brings them a big fat price for their property. It's an A property. They sell it. It's Their money's in escrow. They're trying to do a 1031 exchange, and lo and behold, all they can find are B properties or C properties. And I just don't understand that philosophy. So in my case, I have those two criteria. It has happened. It's happened one time. I got offered an absolutely ridiculous amount of pro money for a property that I had only purchased 10 months earlier. I sold it, and we rolled it into two new properties. And so, so your I've, strategy is, is long-term hold? Is that absolutely long-term long -term hold. And when I quote returns, by the way, they are the actual returns generated by the lease. They are not based okay. on projected sale price, based okay. on projected sale price. I don't do that. These are cash flow, monthly distribution investments. So how many deals have you got currently and what's your pipeline look like? In, in fact, uh, let's start with, with today and work backwards. Uh, sure. I'm hoping that within the next two hours I will be in escrow on the next property, uh, okay. which is in Oklahoma. Working backwards from there, there have been eight completed deals. This will be nine. And I am constantly constantly looking for new properties every day it, it is it is ongoing there is a property that i have been following for the last two years in indiana that we are almost to a full agreement on the purchase and sale agreement for that so that will happen probably in the next 60 days and in the meantime i'm constantly looking for whatever the next property will be after these two what are the next 60 days and in the meantime, I'm constantly looking for whatever the next property will be after these two. What are the biggest challenges that you face currently? Is it finding deals or finding investors? Uh, investors. I mean, that's not to say I don't want to minimize the challenge of finding good deals. You know, good deals are like diamonds in the rough. You, you really need to do your due diligence. You've got to, you know, turn over every rock. And like I said, 
you know this plays into one of the the challenges <laughs> that's not that's not readily comes to mind and that is there's a lot of incompetence across the country uh to be blunt and it's very frustrating uh looking at a property working on something only to find out that you know you're 30 60 days into it and some information comes to light and it blows you out because it's just right not- but isn't that yes but you know that's uh, that's uh, look and I'm thoroughly enjoying our conversation so yeah, totally agree with you totally in fact in fact on that same note you know my son is is becoming an entrepreneur literally as we speak and and he's learning he's cutting his teeth and he's learning that that you know there is this this incompetence out there and problems and I say to him listen you know those are good i say the incompetent people are actually good cuz imagine how hard it would be to be successful if everybody was as competent as you are <laughs> exactly okay? right that would be really difficult but you are correct where there is incompetence there is usually you know a, a nugget of of true value that has to be dug out some of it is is it's just frustrating because it's just pure incompetence something that should have been disclosed early on so that I don't wind up spending my time unnecessarily. Okay, so the biggest challenge is, uh, is finding investors. T- tell me, uh, what is the, uh, what's your six months and 12 12- Spending my time unnecessarily. Okay, so the biggest challenge is, uh, is finding investors. T- tell me, uh, what is the, uh, what's your six month and 12 month plan for cranking that effort up? And then let's move to my wrap up questions. Okay, I, I would like to close three to four more deals this year. Yeah, that's going to be dependent upon, obviously, the deal flow as well as the investors. Continuing to get the word out to the marketplace that, you know, what I do is is very different. You know, single tenant, triple net properties, all cash with monthly distributions. That's a very, very unique model. And for those people who are looking for ultra conservative commercial real estate investing, that's me. As a real estate guy, what are the key daily habits that you have that make you and your business successful? I'll start with the very first thing, arrive early to work. Uh, I'm in my office usually by 5.45 a.m. You know, paperwork or computer work or numbers work uh, where the rest of the world or the rest of the your, your region hasn't quite opened up yet. Uh, it also allows me to deal with the East Coast uh, early morning their time as well which I find is the the best time to be able to reach people. That's number one. Number two, be a really good problem solver. And that sounds, that's an easy statement to make, but I will tell you in my experience what's going on in this country today, there are not very many good problem solvers out there. That's number two. Be efficient with your time. Uh, Don't let people waste your time. At the risk of being rude sometimes, you need to tell people to, you know, speak up, be a little bit more blunt, get to the point, so we're not wasting time. I would say the last thing would be what I do is I kind of break up my day into two parts, uh, what I call the income side of the day and the expense side of the day. What are the things that are going to generate income? What are the things that are going to be an expense? And as you might guess, the ones that get, uh, guess the ones that get, uh, <laughs> that get attended to first is the income side of the business. So that gets focused on first and the later part of the day or early evening gets focused on the expense side of the business. Eat well and exercise, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, number two, what has been the hardest lesson you've learned in real estate? You know, I, I, I've, I've touched on it already, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it, it, it's, the, it's the unnecessary incompetence and waste of time that, that goes on in the industry. Uh, that, that's a, that is a, that was, that's a hard lesson to, to deal with because it's ongoing. It just doesn't seem to go away. And the last question, if you could give one piece of advice to somebody who has not yet invested in a crowdfund real estate deal, but is considering investing, what would that advice be? Do your due diligence on the sponsor. Know your sponsor. Know the track record of your sponsor. Know the philosophy. Do your due diligence on the sponsor. Know your sponsor. Know the track record of your sponsor. Know the philosophy of your sponsor. Know anything and everything you possibly can about the sponsor of the deal. Because I can tell you from what I've seen out there, what I've participated in, what I've witnessed, you are better off with a good sponsor that might have a problematic property as opposed to 
being with being in a deal that is a good piece of property with a bad sponsor. What I like most about Jason's model is the focus on long-term steady income from lower-risk real estate assets and the ultra-conservative elimination of debt completely. As I mentioned earlier, Jason has structured his deals in a novel way. So if you want to find out more about how he does this, go to the show notes for today's episode at the National Real Estate Forum.org website, NRE Forum Uncles. Harold's partner is Ray Wertu, who is executive chairman of CBRE, one of the most successful real estate people in the world. Interestingly, and coincidentally, their investment model also includes triple net lease properties, although their minimum investment is, gasp, only $5. Hard to imagine what kind of business model could benefit from such a low entry-level investment, so be sure to listen in next time to find out. You can subscribe to the series so you don't miss the conversation with Harold by going to the National Real Estate Forum.org website, nreforum.org, and hitting any of the links that I've included about halfway down the homepage. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you also to Jason Schwetz of Triple Net Zero Debt for sharing your time with me today. Until next time, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off.